348. Okay, let's settle in, everyone. We'll be starting in about two minutes. This is apparently the advanced analysis tool session. So hopefully uh, you guys will have a lot of fun with this one. Um, I think there are going to be four interactive workshops. Uh, the first is going to be presented by Jason Ernst on his famous uh, Chrome HMM tool, which is very useful to integrate various types of uh, histone modification data sets to infer chromatin states uh, in genomes. And uh, yeah, so I'll let Jason take it from here. Okay, uh, thank you, Anshul, and uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me <coughs> this opportunity to speak with you. So th this tutorial is going to be divided into three parts. I'm going to first give you some general background on uh, chromatin states and Chrome HMM. Then I'm going to uh, talk about how you can access existing cr Chrome HMM annotations of the human genome. And then finally, how one could go about running Chrome HMM on your own set of data. <coughs> so as we've um, heard throughout the workshop about some histone modification that ENCODE has generated, um, and there's multiple different types of histone modifications in terms of um, the histone protein, amino acid residue, and the chemical modifications. And each um, modification can give you some indication of um, what type of genomic um, entities are active or repressed in certain cell types. Um, but in general, there's more than one mark being mapped in any given cell type. And we had reasoned that by integrating multiple different tracks and reasoning about their combinatorial and spatial patterns, we can take that information and then um, give a systematic annotation to the genome. So both discover the patterns that we're observing and then assign each location in the genome to being instance of some pattern. And we term this chromatin states. So the underlying model for this was based on a multivariate hidden Markov model. So what we did was we pre-processed the genome into 200 base pair non-overlapping intervals, and we made a binary presence or absence call if we had enough uh, reads supporting some modification being present based on a Poisson uh, distribution background model. And then we make this assumption that there's various biological entities underlying the genome that might be reoccurring, whether it's enhancers, gene starts, uh, gene bodies, that we don't observe directly, we just observe these histone modifications. And we do this all unsupervised. So what we do is we discover what are uh, <clears throat> sort of the major patterns associated with these types of biological entities. And formally, what we do is we have states of the hidden Markov model. So these are hidden states that are associated with different emission probabilities. And we model the emissions with the product of independent Bernoulli random variables. So depending on what state we're in, we would have a different probability of observing each modification being present. And then there's also transition probabilities between the states. So for example, we could differentiate that we're in a different state here than here, even though we didn't observe any marks at either place, just based on the uh, spatial information. So in the application we had uh, back in 2011 was a collaboration with uh, Brad Bernstein's ENCODE production group, where we had mapped nine marks in, across nine different human cell types, ENCODE uh, cell lines. So this is looking at all the data in one uh, single location, the different colors corresponding to different cell types, and each individual line was a different track. And what we did was we conceptually applied the same modeling approach as if we were looking at one cell type, but we concatenated the cell types, treating them as if they were different chromosomes. So we learned one set of state definitions across all the cell types, but then we would have cell type specific state assignments. So what you're seeing here, the rows correspond to different states, the columns correspond to different input modifications, and the values here correspond to the, what's the probability we would observe that modification if we're in that state? So blue, blue means higher probability. Once we learn one of these models, then we can go across the genome, assign each location to being an instance of the state, and then compute various enrichments. So for example, we might see some states that are heavily enriched closer to gene body or promoters or genes. Um, and then we characterize based on the modifications and the enrichments these states into various classes of 
promoters, whether it's more of an active or inactive or poised, different classes of enhancers, uh, insulator regions, some um, weaker transcription, um, heterochromatic regions. And um, one thing I want to point out is that sometimes we might see two states which have relatively low signal, but the transition structure, which I'm not showing you directly, can be very different from them. So these are cases where you can have two um, different classes of broader domains that have very different types of properties. Um, so even if you see two states with low pr um, probabilities, that doesn't mean that they're not distinct from each other, um, and they can both represent large parts of the genome. So this is another view of what we've done. I'm taking the same gene in four different cell types. Each row here corresponds to a heat map of the original input data, so darker intensity means a um, higher presence of that mark. And then we can summarize this data into a single chromatin state call, or color coding. So in this case, at the time, we had uh, nine cell types, and somebody could go across some location in the genome and then quickly get a sense of what type of chromatin state it's in, and you can start seeing variability here. For example, this uh, gene promoter in ES, it's in a poised state, it's in a, a repressed state here, it's sort of empty and active state here, and more of an active state in these five cell types. And uh, these tracks were uh, made available on the UCSC genome browser. Um, and then we had used these to start interpreting disease-associated variants, and we're finding enrichment for certain states, um, some of the cell type specific enhancers for GWAS uh, variants, and um, it's been used uh, in the recent paper in the New England Journal of Medicine to interpret the FPO loci and uh, many other um, applications in the literature of using these chromatin states to interpret disease associated genetic variation and epigenetic variation. So, now how um, can you go about accessing some of these chromatin state annotations? I'm going to uh, focus uh, on how to access sort of the largest collection of chromatin state annotations in terms of the number of cell types. So uh, we had some previous models based on six or nine cell types, and they're available in the UCSC genome browser as well. But I want to walk you through um, this chromatin state models, or a couple related ones that were part of a paper that, um, based on the Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium effort, which was based on 111 reference epigenomes produced by the Roadmap Epigenome Consortium, as well as 16 produced by ENCODE Phase II that were reprocessed through the same um, pipelines as the Roadmap to give a uh, uniform set of chromatin state calls. And this is showing you here in this color coding different high-level groupings of these uh, cell types. Uh, so we had uh, coverage of very diverse types of uh, human cells and tissue types. And we had a model here learned on five core histone modifications were which were mapped across 127 of these reference epigenomes, and this is showing you a browser view at one location of these. Um, and they were classified into, again, different types of promoters, enhancers, gene regions, um, repetitive and heterochromatic regions. Um, and then we had another model which was based on six marks, including uh, H3K27 acetylation, and this one had 18 states in this model. It was defined on 98 cell and tissue types. Uh, one thing you might notice here is that this matrix is incomplete, and if we wanted to keep on defining uh, these chromatin state models on a set of cell types for which we have the same marks on every cell type, and we keep adding marks, we would get fewer and fewer cell types. So instead, we used an alternative strategy where we first imputed the epigenomic data. I won't have time to go into the details about this method, but it was published in, uh, in 2015, and the idea was we could leverage the fact that we had, in any given cell type we were interested in, other marks mapped in it, and we have had that mark mapped in other cell types, so we could use both types of information, how that mark behaved in other cell types and how other marks behave in the cell type you're interested in to figure out computationally what one of these CHIP-seq or related experiments should look like without actually doing an experiment. And then once we have the imputed data, we learned a chromatin state model uniformly across the imputed data for 12 marks for which we had the most data to perform the imputation on. And we defined 25 different states, and this model is described in uh, this paper. 
And this is a view of the chromatin state annotations across all these um, 127 cell and tissue types. So just to summarize this, um, we now have two models based directly on the observed data, one based on five marks, one based on six marks, including H3K27 acetyl. And now we also have one based on 127 um, cell and tissue types based on 12 marks, but based on imputed data. And this is a summary of the chromatin state annotations. So we have a color coding of related states and then a candidate annotation. So when we give one of these annotations, uh, this is sort of a semi-automated part where the um, human comes in and describes these states based on the enrichment and such. So it shouldn't be taken um, too literally, but it gives you a sense of the differences between these states. Um, so now how can we go about um, <coughs> bringing this up in the UCSC genome browser? Uh, I won't do a live demo because the internet's a little shaky, but feel free to try on your own uh, computer. So you need to be in the UCSC genome browser in the browser view, and then you want to be in HG19. And then you would want to click on the button Track Hubs in order to access this menu. So once you go to the Track Hubs, uh, you'll see a list of possible um, sort of places you can connect to. And you want to connect to Roadmap Epigenomics Integrative Analysis Hub. Um, and just to note, there's another track hub which sounds similar and has some overlapping data called Epigenomics Data Complete Collection, but don't click that one. Click this one, Ep Roadmap Epigenomics Integrative Analysis Hub, and you click Connect. And these slides should be available on the website if you need to um, sort of go back to something as I go through this. And once you click Connect, it um, should take you back to this gateway screen. And then if you click Go, it'll take you back to the browser. Um, and then you should now see this menu here, Roadmap Epigenomics Integrative Analysis Hub. And then you'll have um, this one here, this first one on that menu bar where it stands for consolidated by assay, and you would want to have that do show, and then you would want to click on it. And then you would want to click on the first row there, Chrome HMM, and make sure it's set to show, dense, checked, um, and then click on that Chrome HMM um, option. And then this is where you have the choice to view so the primary is the one based on the five marks directly on the observed data. Auxiliary is based on the six marks on 98 of the cell types. And you'll see there's some missing boxes. So those are ones that didn't have H3K27 to settle. And then the imputed one is those based on the 12 marks using the imputed data. Um, and then the data type here needs to um, match or it's OK to have both checked. So by default, you can click both of them. And then, in this case, I click this plus at the very top to highlight all the imputed tracks. If you were just interested in a couple cell types, you wouldn't necessarily have to track, click everything. Um, and then I've set it to dense. So with this, it's going to bring up all the imputed um, tracks. So you hit submit after you've checked that. And then you have now on your browser a view of the chromatin state annotations across these 127 reference epigenomes. And these slides are um, on the website if you need to sort of go through one of these steps again. And I'll be available at the um, session this evening if um, you got hung up on some step. So now I'm going to talk about how to actually uh, run the Chrome HMM software if you had new data that you wanted to have chromatin state annotations for, or you wanted to process some existing data in a different way. So in this case, uh, you would want to go to the Chrome HMM website and download the software. It's about a 30 megabyte byte file, so um, depending on what the connection speeds are like right now, um, it might take a few minutes to download if you're interested in um, running it right now. And 
just to point out some other things about this um, website, there's a manual here which has all the sort of details about a lot of the commands and options that I won't have time to talk about. And we also have some other things, some links to existing chromatin state annotations, um, the ones I mentioned through the roadmap portal, as well as direct links to the uh, UCSC browser for some of the older uh, models based on the uh, ENCODE cell types, as well as um, some chromatin state annotations uh, produced by Ross Hardison's group in MOUSE um, as, as part of the MOUSE ENCODE efforts. And you can also subscribe to a mailing list to get announcements of new versions. So if you've uh, downloaded the software, um, you'll get a file chromehmm.zip. And what you would want to do is you would unzip it. So this is assuming you have Java already installed on your system. So except for Java, the, there's no dependencies otherwise with Chrome HMM. Then after you unzip it, you need to open a command line. And then you would want to change into the Chrome HMM directory where the Chrome HMM .jar file is sitting. And then you would want to enter this command. And I'll show this command again, but if you're following along on your computer, um, now's a good time to enter it. So it's all one line here. And this is going to run it from HMM on the sample data. So, And I'll t walk um, people through what all these options mean, but it takes a few minutes to run. So if you're following along on your own computer, uh, you would want to type in this command. And it's also on the slides if um, you haven't copied this yet. So I've hit enter, and then it's going to start learning a model, and it's giving you progress updates. And it's actually, as it's running, it's writing the latest model found to the um, directory, uh, output directory. So if you were eager to start seeing the model and potentially just wanted a quick version, um, after a, f a few iterations, it already can give you a good sense of the model. Um, and then the <coughs> it starts making incremental improvements later on. So now to s discuss the input to Chrome HMM. So the actual modeling of Chrome HMM is based on binarized data. So Chrome HMM modeling part sees sort of ones and zeros at some resolution. The default is 200 base pair resolution. And I mean, there's multiple ways of producing that, but the recommended way is to give Chrome HMM um, a set of aligned reads. And this can either be in BAM format or if you have it in um, BED format too. Um, and it has a different uh, command, either binarized BED or binarized BAM, depending on the format of your aligned reads, but uh, otherwise the commands are based or the same. And I'll walk you through this binarized um, BED command, and it's the same if it was in BAM file. So you have here the Java, to tell um, that you're using Java, then you specify the amount of memory uh, Java should have access to, dash jar, and then Chrome HMM dot jar. And depending on sort of the size of your project, you might need to increase the amount of memory. Then this is the command to Chrome HMM. So there's several high-level commands. So binarized bed and binarized BAM and learn models are examples. And um, if we have time, I'll talk about some of the other high-level commands. And they're all described in the manual. Then there's a file which um, has the lengths of the chromosomes. So this needs to point to the chromosome um, length file. So there's a directory chrome size which has a number of files already preloaded. Um, if you're going to be working with a different assembly that Chrome HMM doesn't support by default, then you need to download it. But most standard assemblies are already in that directory. So you just need to um, specify that file. It might be a forward slash on your system. Then a directory of where the bed files are sitting, or BAM files if you had BAM files. Then a s file here, which is sort of gives the overall design. And Chrome HMM, so the first column, this is assuming if you're doing 
the learning in a concatenated form where you had multiple different cell types. The first column would specify the different cell types. Then you would have the next column, the different marks, and then the BED or BAM file corresponding to that cell or mark file. And it can also take zip files as well. And then you can also specify a control file. And this is optional, and you can also use control data as a feature as well. Um, and if you specify control here, then it'll binarize the data, taking into account the background level of reads. And then the last option, required option, is the output directory where the binarized data should be um, written. And um, this is the output of Chrome HMM. So if you were running learn model on the sample data, you would get a report like this. Um, I'll talk about this output in a second, but just going back to the uh, presentation, um, how you get to that. So if you didn't copy that command in before, this is it again. Um, so to walk you through these options, so the, this part is similar to before, and now learn model's the first high-level command. This is one non-default option, so I set it to dash P0, and what this allows Chrome HM um, to do is access as many um, processors as are available on a multiprocessor machine. So this is one way to speed up Chrome HMM learning is to run it on a multiprocessor and give it a number of cores. Uh, if you don't specify anything, it'll just use one core and has a slightly different learning method that takes it, doesn't use the parallelization. Um, and then you can also specify exactly how many cores you want it to use. Then there's the directory which has the binarized input that would have been produced by binarized bed or binarized bam. Then you have the directory where you want the output files to go. So this is where you'll have the segmentations Chrome HMM produces as well as um, the model files and some automated enrichments it computes. Then you specify here the number of states. Um, and in practice, oftentimes what we'll do is we'll learn models with different numbers of states on a cluster and then sort of compare what types of states are coming out of it and sort of at the level of um, biological interpretation, um, sort of choose one model to analyze in more depth. And then we specify the genome assembly. So this um, was, sample data was from an older assembly, HG18, but you can specify other assemblies um, here as well. And now, if you had run Chrome HMM on your computer, you would have had something like this automatically open in your browser if you had a browser enabled. Otherwise, it'll just write this to the directory. And what it gives you is um, an output here where the first part is a summary of what the options were. So you have this record of what you ran Chrome HMM with. Um, so these were sort of the required options, and this was the full command. Then if you look here, right under model parameters, you see the emission parameters of the model. So this is showing you in darker shading, if we're in that state, we have a higher probability of observing that mark. And you can, in addition to having this in a regular image format, you can also get an SVG format or download it in a tab delimited text file. And then you can also view the transition probability. So this is telling you if you're in some state, what's the probability you would be in, the next, in that state at the next location in the genome. And that's how Chrome HMM is able to capture a lot of spatial information and can often differentiate between two states that might have similar um, low emissions, but some subtle differences could make a significant impact with the transition information to capture broader domains. Then you'll see the model parameter file. And this isn't designed to necessarily be um, sort of human readable. But if you want to run Chrome HMM again and produce the segmentation without relearning the model, uh, it, this file is useful for some of the other commands. Then you have the segmentation files produced in multiple different um, formats. So the standard one, which is sort of easiest to use for additional computational processing, is the chromosome, the start and the end coordinate embed file. And then these are the um, annotations. So 
The number here corresponds to which state it is. The E corresponds to the states were originally ordered by emission. There's options to sort of reorder the states and then it can get a different prefix. And then because we ran this on two different cell types, we have two different segmentation files, one for each cell type. Then we have a set of browser files where one can uh, take these files and load them into browsers such as UCSC Genome Browser or IGV. And there's two different types of formats. One is a dense file, which allows you to view in a single track with different color codings of different states. The other one is uh, where you have one state per line and that line's held um, fixed. Then you'll start seeing some automated enrichments available that Chrome h &M computed based on a set of coordinates that were preloaded. You have the option before you run Chrome h &M to add additional um, other coordinates you're interested in comparing this segmentation to and it'll show that or at a later time there's another command overlap enrichment where you can run that with the um, segmentation and just um, get additional enrichments computed. And what this is showing you is that the relative enrichment for different categories in different states, and then if you actually click on this file, you can see numerical fold enrichments for each one of these categories. And it also provides positional enrichment plots. For example, it's showing you that certain states are more enriched over transcription start sites than others as well. And again, all these files can be downloaded in also text or SVG format. And then um, you have enrichments, again, are based on uh, each cell type, so we'll have different enrichments for each cell type. And then in the remaining uh, few minutes, I just want to mention briefly some additional commands that are available in Chrome HMM. <clears throat> so these would be sort of first-level commands analogous to the binarized BED or BAM or LEARN model. So the first one we have is compare models. So if you've Learn a set of models with different number of states. You can ask for a fixed um, reference model. So usually this might be the model with the most number of states. To what extent are there states and models with um, fewer numbers of states for which there's a correlation between some state of that model and each of these states in the larger model? So for example, what this is saying is there's some state here in this model of 51 states for which all these other models are heavily correlated in terms of the emission parameters, but then once you go below 34 states, it doesn't correlate well. So that could suggest that you're potentially missing whatever this state represents. So you might want to go and inspect what that state is, and then if you feel that that state is sort of biologically important to your analysis, then you've effectively established a lower bound on the number of states you should um, choose. So this is a quick way to uh, get a sense of some of the trade-offs between different states. Uh, you can run, regenerate these browser files and use a different color scheme and you can also add labels to the state, so give them state names and that, that can be incorporated into the browser file. And then there's also overlap enrichment, which I briefly mentioned before, which allows you to rerun the enrichments that automatically get computed but now you can also um, add additional files that you might not have sort of had preloaded into the input coordinate directory. And you can also do a similar thing with run neighborhood enrichment after you have the model segmentation produced. You could rerun that later with a set of anchor positions and get positional plots. And you can also reorder the states of the model. So Chrome HMM has this default um, ordering the states, but you can also decide that you would prefer them ordered in a different way and you can reorder the model. Uh, so just to summarize, um, I presented to you a method for annotating um, genomes based on integrating multiple different epigenetic marks, um, and we've applied Chrome HMM to more than 100 different cell and tissue types, and those annotations are available. Um, on the UCSC Genome Browser, and they're also available directly on the um, roadmap portal, which I didn't have time to show you. And then Chrome HM software is available for you to run on your own data. And that's the URL. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, a lot of this 
work was done um, while I was a postdoc with Manolis Tellis and I uh, continued some of this work after I moved to UCLA. A lot of the ENCODE work was done in collaboration with Brad Bernstein and his production group. And then there was a whole lot of people within the ep Roadmap Epigenomics uh, Consortium involved in producing and processing these data. Um, so thank you for your attention. I thank you very much for your talk. I have a question about Chrome Impute. Um, so it would make sense to me that germline cells might have correlations of features. Also makes sense to me that cancer cells might be a lot more whacked off and have show or fewer correlations. Is that something you looked at in making Chrome Impute or you can comment on that? Um, so the, the question is, I mean, to what extent can we like, in some types of cells, better impute data than in other types of cells? Yes. Um, yeah, so I mean, the roadmap, data was uh, largely normal cell types, and then we did have a few ENCODE, like cancer cell lines. Um, we didn't notice like a large difference for those, but we didn't do sort of primary cancer cell types. I can't um, sort of comment exactly on how it would perform on that. But I mean, in general, what it, the assumptions behind it is, I mean, the correlation structures between histone marks is relatively well preserved across cell types. So if you have some sample for which that assumption is no longer true and like marks don't correlate with how they're usually correlated and you haven't seen that mark at that position in any other cell type, then it would be very difficult to impute what the assumption is making. So. Uh, yeah, two, two things. I guess the first is I'm wondering to what extent you've observed the quality of the ChIP-seq data influencing the inferred hidden states. And then secondarily, uh, if you look at sort of biologically meaningful subsets of the data, how stable are the hidden state definitions? Um, yeah, I mean, so I guess it's sort of if it was garbage in, garbage out. So I mean, it's really going to depend on the degree of the data. I mean, one thing with the chromatin states is that you're making the annotation based on multiple different tracks. So if one of the tr tracks is of sort of mediocre quality, but you had enough other tracks, it can sort of give you a reasonable set of state assignments, even if not every track is um, ideal. And then in terms of um, sort of robustness to like subsets of the data. We have done things where we've taken a model and we've um, sort of taken the two different um, replicates associated with it and then see to what extent the state assignments agree between the replicates. And I mean, we get relatively good agreement. You'll have some states that are more similar to each other and you'll have some confusion among those um, states. Uh, I was wondering about normalization across tracks, like if uh, some tracks have more reads than others, how does that affect the state calling? <laughs> I don't know if you've already answered this question. So. Um, right. I mean, so what, if you had sort of, if you had sort of arbitrarily many reads in one experiment then, and you just use a default Poisson binarization, I mean, at some point it would start calling sort of present for anything with a sort of very weak fold enrichment and sort of the limit. Um, what we did in the roadmap um, consortium effort is we s sort of subsampled all the experiments that were above um, 30 or 50 million reads, depending on the mark, to have a little more balance between that. Um, so if you want to subsample the reads, you can do that outside of uh, Chrome HMM and then just give it the subsampled reads. And then, but yeah, but I mean, it's. You recommend it, starting with a similar number for all? Yeah, I mean, it, I don't think it's very sensitive to, I mean, small differences, but if you have sort of gross differences, um, I mean, that is something you should be aware of. And the other thing is, Chrome HMM also has an option to add a fold enrichment cutoff, which can also um, sort of handle the problem. If you had sort of extremely deep sequence, you can just sort of add a fold enrichment cutoff, and that's another way to handle it without subsampling. Okay, let's thank Jason again. Go on to the next session. 
So the next workshop will be presented by Max Lebrist, um, who's from uh, University of Washington, uh, Seattle, and he'll be talking about um, a, a similar approach called Segway that also essentially uh, can provide chromatin state maps and other related tools uh, in the Segway family, right? <coughs> All right, thanks, Anshul, and thanks for having me here to present. Um, I'm going to present today um, a tutorial on uh, a suite of tools that the Noble Lab developed called Genome Data Segway and Seg Tools. So in this uh, tutorial, we're going to assume that we've just performed a bunch of genomics assays on some new cell type, uh, and we've gone through the process of mapping and uh, making signal tracks from those cell types so that we have a bunch of uh, signal data that might be in bed graph format uh, where we have, where each assay is represented as a real value track over the genome. So I'm going to show you a pipeline for uh, how you might make sense of these data sets. First, um, a tool called genome data, which is used for storing and compressing genomics data sets. Segway, which is a tool that's similar to ChromeHMM for uh, annotating the genome based on genomics data. And then SegTools, which is a suite of tools um, for uh, making plots and analyzing any type of genome annotation. And I should say that all these tools are uh, independent from one another. You can use genome data uh, to store your data even if you're not using Segway, and you can use SegTools to analyze any type of genome annotation, not necessarily just uh, Segway or even Chrome HMM annotations. Um, to, so these tools were developed on Linux. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if they work or not on Mac OS. We haven't done much testing with them, but they probably do because the, the platforms are pretty similar. Um, so we'll assume we have a Linux machine available. If you don't personally have a Linux uh, computer yourself, you can always get uh, one, for example, Amazon EC2. And then to install all these tools, you're just going to run these commands on your command line to install them on your computer. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the commands uh, one by one, but uh, I think these slides are available, so uh, you can go through these. But mostly it's just uh, installing these, uh, the tools. They're all in Linux uh, package manager packages. And then also the documentation for all these tools uh, are available at these links. So here, uh, genome data segue and seg tools. And again, these are, uh, these slides should be available, so you shouldn't have to write down these links. Okay, so let's start with genome data. Genome data is a tool for storing and compressing genomics data sets. So uh, a genome data archive is just a big binary file that lives on your file system, uh, and it contains inside it a bunch of genomics tracks represented as real values over the genome. So you might have one track that's GM12878 H3K4 trimethylation, a histone modification, that's uh, this, this track over the genome. And one genome data archive can store all of your uh, genome data sets. So the, the key feature that makes genome data really useful is it supports random access. So you can, um, any position you want in the genome, you can just uh, ask the genome data archive to give you the data associated with that position, and the, the tool doesn't need to uh, read through the whole data set or load the whole data set into memory in order to query. Um, it's also, it also compresses the data. And the way it does that is through a, a binary for, format called HDF5 that's built for high performance, um, sort of a floating point storage. Um, so to load your data into genome data, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to use the genome data load assembly command. You're going to tell it what you want your genome data archive to be called, and you're going to tell it the uh, genome sequence for your genome assembly. So you can get this uh, genome sequence for the human genome from this link, from UCSE. Um, genome data also has commands where if you don't want to download the whole genome data, uh, human genome sequence, you can uh, just give it the, the lengths of the chromosomes. So that will generate an empty genome data archive for you, and in order to uh, add your data to it, you're going to do this process for each track. So HDF5 is a little funny in how you have to uh, load the data. You have to do three steps. You have to open the box, put stuff in the box, and then close the box. So there are three commands, genome data open data, 
you give it the name of your archive and the name you want your track to be called. So in this case, we're putting in data for H3K4 trimethylation in GM12878, and we can call it whatever we want. This is just uh, the name we're giving it. Uh, we run this command, genome data load data, and input the bed graph data that we have, uh, that we produced, and, we, and this is all one line, by the way, uh, it just didn't fit on the screen. And then we run closed data on our archive. So once we've done that, we have all our data in the archive. Now how do we use it for any kind of downstream analysis we want to do, whether that's running Segway or something else? So first thing we want to do is query the data on the command line, and you can do that just using this command genome data query. You give it your archive, the track you want, and the coordinates you want, and it will uh, output the data in WIG format. Uh, so just here's the values from that uh, position. So it's just grabbing some data from your archive. Genome data also has a Python interface, uh, and it works the same way. So to use it, you're going to import the genome data Python module. Uh, this is after we're inside Segway. You can just get to here by typing in Python on your, sorry, we're inside Python. You get there just by typing Python on your command line. You're going to make this uh, genome object using this command. Now it's important to note that this command doesn't load the entire genome data archives data onto your computer. It's just sort of opening connection the same way you'd open a connection to a file. And then for whatever coordinates you want, again, we're going to take uh, chromosome 1, uh, these coordinates for this track. We can just uh, ask the genome data for this, these coordinates, and it's going to go get them from our computer. Okay, and a couple other commands that are handy for genome data. Uh, these are useful if you forget which assembly you defined uh, your archive on or which tracks you have. So we can run this command genome data info and say track names for our uh, archive and it'll just give us the list of track names. Uh, or we can run genome data dash info contigs data dot genome data and that'll give us the coordinates that our archive is defined on. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to move on to uh, the second tool I'm going to present uh, called Segway. Segway is a, another, uh, like Chrome HMM, Segway is a semi-automated genome annotation algorithm. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this because Jason just uh, presented Chrome HMM. But just as a recap, a semi-automated genome annotation algorithm takes as input a collection of genomics data sets uh, and produces it a segment and labels the genome such that positions with the same label have similar patterns in the signal data. Um, and then uh, we call these tools semi-automated because what the, uh, what the algorithm gives you are just integer labels because it's unsupervised. It doesn't know about things like promoters and enhancers. And then it's up to a human to interpret that maybe label one is actually a representation of enhancer, maybe label two is a representation of exon, and so on. So the best, the most well-known tools uh, that do semi-automated genome annotation are HMMSeg, Chrome HMM, and Segway. Uh, Chrome HMM and Segway are pretty similar. Um, the main difference is, is that Chrome HMM uses binary data and Segway uses uh, the, the real floating point data. And then also Segway uh, can be run down to one base pair resolution. Uh, so to run Segway, uh, it's going to look a lot like running Chrome HMM. It has a two steps, a train step and an identify step. The train step goes from the data to a model, and then the identify step produces an annotation from that model. Um, so you're going to run these two steps, uh, and we give it as input a genome data archive and the output directory we want it to go to. For the identify step, we give it the uh, training directory and also the identify directory that we want to, the annotation to be output to. And then as output, we get this file, which is in BED4 format, so it's just for each, uh, along the genome, it has a chromosome, a start, an end, and an integer label for each position in the genome. Uh, Segway is, defined to, is designed to use a compute cluster, uh, so it, can, it supports either grid engine or platform LSF. Um, if you have a compute cluster, it's probably, uh, it probably is running one of these two uh, Plat, um, cluster engines, and Segway will automatically determine which 
type of cluster you're running and it will start and will automatically use your cluster. But if you want to run Segway without a cluster, you can just uh, set this environment variable uh, in your shell uh, and that will tell Segway to run just on your local computer, which is handy for testing. So we're going to, I'm going to go through a bunch of uh, options you can give to the Segway program to alter its behavior. Um, so the first thing we're going to want to do is tell Segway which tracks we want the annotation to be defined on. So by default, Segway will run on everything in your genome data archive, which isn't usually what you want to do. So you can use these options, track equals some track name, uh, to tell it which uh, tracks to use. You can specify this command multiple times to specify multiple tracks, or you can put a, a long list of tracks into uh, some file and reference that file using the tracks from uh, option. So in this case, tracks from is this, or sorry, tracks.txe is this file which has these two uh, track names in it. You can change what coordinates you want Segway to run on. By default, it's going to run on the whole genome as defined by the genome data archive. But sometimes, especially for testing, you might want to run on just a subset of the genome. You can do that with the include chords uh, option and you give it some bed file, uh, which again is just in this format, chromosome start stop. Then usually, um, so one thing we've known in ENCODE is that there are some parts of the genome that just have weird artifactual behavior when you run ChIP-seq on them. So Anshul has uh, developed some blacklist coordinates. They cover on the order of 1% of the genome and they're just positions that uh, have weird artifactual behavior. And it's usually a good idea anytime you're training any kind of model to leave uh, these coordinates out of your analysis. Uh, and you can do that with Segway just the, with the exclude chords uh, command. You don't have to um, remove them from your bed file yourself. Um, you can get those blacklist files from this URL. Uh, then, now it also uh, used to be that we would train Segway on 1% of the genome. That's just because uh, there's a lot more data in the genome than you really need uh, for every iteration. It's inefficient to perform training on the whole genome at each iteration. We used to train on just 1% of the genome. Uh, a new feature we've added is that instead of training on a fixed 1% of the genome, we use what are called 1% one, 1 mini batches. So Segway will train on a different 1% of the genome at each iteration. So that means it will still have access to all the data in the genome. Uh, but it, you will still have fast iterations. Okay, now some uh, parameters you, want, you might want to change for your annotation. The first thing you can change is the number of labels you want Segway to assign. Um, so if you give it just two labels, you're just going to get, of course, a, an annotation with two labels, and more labels is going to be a more complex annotation. Uh, we, we've generally run Segway with on the order of 10 to 20 labels, uh, anything between maybe 4 and 50 is a good number. Um, Segway uh, uses the expectation maximization algorithm, uh, which is not guaranteed to give the optimum. Uh, so what you can specify with Segway is how many different times you want Segway to start from a new in initialization. It'll start from multiple initializations and pick the best one. And this parameter determines how many times it'll do that. I recommend we usually use 10. And you can also specify the maximum number of training iterations you want. Uh, the smaller the number, the faster uh, training will go, but you might get a worse model out. Okay, you can also control the average lengths of the segments that you'll get out of Segway. So depending on what you're interested in looking at in your data, you might be interested in segments on different scales. So if you're looking at things uh, like promoters and enhancers, you're probably looking at segments that are on the order of 1,000 base pairs, 1 kb. Uh, if you really want to dig down and look at really the, the structure of each uh, promoter, maybe finding uh, where the transcription factors are binding uh, and where the nucleosome free regions are, you, can, you might be interested in much smaller segments all the way down to maybe 10 or 20 bases. So you can control the segment lengths uh, using Segway three ways. One is to change the resolution that Segway runs at. Um, Segway supports all the way down to one base pair resolution. Um, you can use, uh, we've used anything up to 
uh, 10,000 bases. Uh, we've used that when we're looking at not things like promoted enhancers, but large domains on the scale of a megabase. Um, the resolution, the higher it is, uh, the faster, uh, the higher this number is, the faster your, your training is going to go. Uh, but of course, it will downsample the data, and so you're losing some information by doing that. Uh, there's also, you can put a prior on the, having long segments. Uh, that prior can go, it's just some number, and higher will, on average, give you longer segments. And you can also change the weight that the model puts on the transition part of the model relative to the emission part of the model. Um, so putting more weight on the transition part of the model tends to give you longer segments. Uh, and so again, you can increase this to, to increase the segment length. Uh, usually want ha you want this to be ab about the number of tracks. So if you find you run your annotation and your uh, segments are too short for your liking, you can uh, play with these parameters to either increase or decrease your segment lengths. Okay, so that, that was uh, how to run Segway. Now I'm going to present SegTools, which is um, a suite of commands for analyzing uh, annotations. And like I said, this can be used for any type of genome annotation. It can be used for Segway or Chromatrimum annotations, or if maybe you've produced your own um, annotation of the genome, you can use SegTools uh, as a really easy way to make plots and, and analyze those annotations. So, uh, SegTools has a bunch of different commands. I'm just going to go through three of them. Signal distribution is one command that measures the relationships between annotation labels and signal tracks. So you give it some annotation, uh, which it will be in, again, that BED4 format that Segway uses, and a collection of genomics data sets in genome data format. And SegTools signal distribution will produce a plot that looks like this, with labels on the horizontal axis tracks on the vertical axis and the color indicating the strength of association between a given track and a given label. So in this case, maybe uh, I just made these up, but in this case, this label might be uh, uh, associated with H3K27 acetylation and uh, not associated with H3K27 trimethylation. Another uh, command, SegTools length distribution, measures the segment lengths uh, of a annotation. So you give it uh, an annotation and it produces these two types of plots. One is a plot for each label, what fraction of the genome does that label cover? And it will tell you both the fraction as a, uh, a function of bases and of segments. Uh, and it looks like this. And it'll also tell you the distribution of segment lengths of segments with that label. So these are violin plots. It's kind of like a histogram of the lengths of that segment. So you can see this label uh, looks like it has small segments on the order of a couple hundred bases, where this label has uh, segments closer to a thousand bases. And finally, SegTools aggregation measures the association uh, between two types of genome annotations. One is a labeled annotation that you might get out of Segway or Chromatrimm, uh, and it can take three types of annotations. One is a region annotation, so these might be annotated enhancers, for example. A point annotation, which might be um, uh, motif uh, positions, transcription factor binding sites, anything like that. Or a gene annotation. Uh, so both of these two it, it will accept um, a bed format. This is GFF format, which is a, um, which is a, gene, uh, a gene annotation format. So here I'm showing you an example where I've run Segway aggregation in gene mode uh, and given it this GFF file. And here's the plot uh, it gives me. So it has uh, different compartments for different positions relative to a gene, starting with the upstream region, the first intron, the first exon, uh, sorry, other way around, first exon, first intron, the middle exons and introns, the last exon and introns, and then the downstream region. And the vertical axis in these plots indicates uh, the strength of enrichment or depletion. So for example, this label, label one, is enriched in the upstream and first uh, exon region, 
So it looks like it might be uh, some sort of regulatory, uh, uh, looks like it's some sort of regulatory element, whereas this one, label seven, looks like it's depleted all around genes, meaning it's probably some sort of repressive uh, label. Um, so, so SegTools aggregation will give you associations between uh, different types of annotations. Okay, so those were the three uh, uh, tools. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks for your attention. To run some customized data on our local machines. The question is whether whether you can run these on your own custom data? So yeah, I mean, the just call some modules, for example, some Python scripts from, from other machines to run this, just generate some plots. Or it's only bottled it within your old package. We have to send the data into your uh, pipeline that run that. No, so these are, these are just packages you can install on your computer, and all you have to do is run the command line, uh, and, it'll, and it'll run. So you can use, you don't, like I said, it doesn't have to be, for example, for seg tools, it doesn't have to be a segue annotation for it to be accepted by seg tools. Yeah, just a question. To run, uh, to run segue, do you have a minimum number of a sample or min mi minimum number of uh, marks? The question is if there's a minimum number of marks to run segue? Uh, either, either sample, number of sample and marks. So segue uh, d default by default runs on just one sample. Okay. Um, it also supports a concatenated mode like Chrome, Chrome HMM does, but, but you can run it on just one sample. And there's, in the code, there's no minimum on the number of tracks. You can give it just one track. Uh, okay. But obviously it's gonna be more interesting annotation the more tracks you give it. Okay, so, so H, uh, I mean, uh, Chrome, uh, Chrome HM, you can run much, much, multiple tracks together, right? For Say again? For the Chrome, uh, Chrome uh, yeah. Uh, Chrome HMM, you basically run multiple mar mar mark together to, to get the chromatin state. So your uh, seg will only run one mark at a time? No, one. One sample. One sample meaning one cell type. You can either do one cell type or you can input, input multiple cell types. That's okay. true for both segue and chrome HMM. And both segue and chrome HMM, you can choose how many different marks you want to give it. Uh, you may have mentioned this. What w which was the step at which you actually did the manual annotation of the um, uh, of the of the regions of the elements? Right. So Segway. The question is, uh, where do you do the manual annotation? So Segway will give you that file in bed four format with an integer label. Um, there's a command in SegTools that I didn't tell you about called SegTools relabel, where you just give it a mapping from integer labels to what we call mnemonics, just your names for those labels. So you might want to rename label one to promoter. Um, and you can run your annotation through SegTools relabel to change the labels. Also SegTools, all the um, commands support a mnemonic file where you don't need to rename the, uh, the labels in the file and it will just do that renaming for you before it makes the plot. But of course you have to do that, that interpretation uh, manually and produce that mnemonic file. Uh, do you have a thought? Oh, go ahead. Oh, it's I don't know where you're talking. Yeah, yeah go sorry. Ahead. <laughs> um, do you have a thought process for when this makes the most sense and when it makes sense to binarize the data and use an HMM? Like what kinds of data should be treated in each way? So I generally think that um, usually you're losing some information by binarizing the data, um, but maybe uh, Jason will, will tell you differently. But you probably also run into a set of issues around normalizing chip seek if you're gonna treat it as real valued, right? So there's some challenges there too. Right, that is uh, a question. So the question is what, um, what real value do you use to represent the data? Um, we use the fold enrichment transformed with an inverse hyperbolic sign transform. Uh, inverse hyperbolic sign is similar to a log transform. Let's, uh, let's thank Max again.